And when I realized what love should be like, it made God harder to take seriously. If you love me, you wouldn't do those things to me. Like my partner does not treat me. He takes care of me. If he sees something that's happening to me and he can help me, he does. I don't have to beg him. I don't have to remind him of how great he is. I don't have to boost his ego up. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're the best. There's none like you. I don't have to do that for him to take care of me. On today's episode of The Life After, we're talking with our friend Verdell Wright. Verdell is a theology nerd in the purest sense, boasting theology degrees from Rutgers, Howard, and Wesley Theological Seminary. Verdell is also black and gay. Put all those things together, along with a very intelligent, well-conceived deconstruction, and you get a powerful thinker, writer, and advocate. Verdell very recently published a piece for the Black Youth Project about how he went from being a sought-after minister to leaving the Christian faith, or pushing beyond the Christian faith, as he likes to put it. In our interview with Verdell, we cover everything from the problem of theodicy, to coming out, to what it's like to be the token black guy in a, quote, progressive white church. I'm Chuck Parson. I'm Brady Harden. And And this this is is The Life Life After. Hello, everyone. I'm your... Ah, Damn it. Just off to a great start. Right. (laughs) Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. And you're you're listening listening to to Life Life After. After. Uh, Brady, how, how are you? Uh, you know, I've been doing good. Uh, it's been an interesting week. I've been thinking a lot about indoctrination for some reason. Um, wrote a blog on it. I know we've got an episode that's going to be really, we've got an episode by the time, coming out. Yeah. By the time we have this out, that episode will be out. Right. right. Yeah. Indoctrination's kind of been the a next big one. theme in my mind recently. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a tough one to tackle. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to chat with you about something. Yeah, go ahead. Brady. Um, I was thinking, um, and in light maybe particularly because of the uh, because of the guests that we have on today Mm -hmm. um or maybe uh just in general um i've been thinking about how churches are so um like the sort of i think an important we're talking about indoctrination right i think an important part of like how you maintain a like uh, a system that's built on these kind of like feeble presuppositions Mm -hmm. is by like finding a bunch of people that are a lot like you right yes so so what i kind of want to talk about is like churches as like relatively homogenous things right like there it's a lot of the same like whether it's i mean whether we're talking like ethnically or like uh, just in terms of like well, uh, of sex- homo. sexuality yeah 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 um yeah uh, um gender all those things are like pretty set right well where where i grew up in arnold missouri um in the mega church that i went to uh the church was about 2000 people on a on a sunday and uh I, every family was white and straight um there was yeah. one interracial couple and they were known as the interracial couple uh-huh. you know and yeah. i know that the the husband had to deal with some racism and stuff even within the church uh leadership and had to kind of put his foot down and he was a he was a big man you know and uh-huh. like you don't mess with him right, so right. um you know that was a big thing Every, everybody just kind of like looked the same believed the same um probably had sex the same way and um <laughs> i think that's kind of what right. helped maintain that sense of community is because there really wasn't that much um challenging the norms because the norm was right all the same what, right. what was it like for you um you know the church that i grew up in when i was really young was uh was pretty i mean it was mostly white i would say and it f- definitely fit the suburban white church mold mm-hmm. but like there was a long period of time where like the head worship pastor was black um, there were a number of black families in the in the congregation. It was a mega church, so there were a lot of people, but um, there was some ethnic diversity. Um, it was certainly taboo at that time to be, you know, diverse in, in terms of sexuality. That wasn't really a thing. I think probably that church now might be. It was it was a fairly like uh, 
populist church, I guess. So it's like it's probably pretty diverse now, even in terms of that. But my, mm-hmm. the second church I went to was Southern Baptist, and there was one Ooh. black lady uh, who w- went to the church, and she would sit in front with a tambourine. Um, and was just really out of place, you know, like, <laughs> like, like, it, I loved that she embraced that she w- it was different than everybody else there and just like stood out, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and wore bright colors and, and, and like danced around with a tambourine. It was great. And there was no problem with that, but it also like was not an environment that fostered any kind of, you know, uh, diversity, diversity yeah. beyond that, you know, like she was there because she was not, wasn't afraid to be bold and just be herself, you know, but if you wanted to, to be, uh, somebody of a different ethnicity and sort of like, uh, feel accepted in that environment, it would have been weird. You would have visited once and left, you know, because the, the worship was super white, the, you know, everybody in there is super white and, um, and definitely homosexuality there was what was way off of the, oh, you yeah, know, definitely. there's no way, right. It was a Southern Baptist church. And there was no question at my church, you know, I was brought up Southern Baptist and of course we were very homophobic, um, which was strange being a, a closeted gay my entire life of trying to figure out how to rectify those things. Yeah. But, um, I mean, once I finally came out and you embraced my sexuality, it was weird to go from like the majority. Cause you know, everybody viewed me as the white Christian male to, now I was like just defined by my gayness yeah, and to yeah, kind yeah. of like feel that shift and to see how differently I was treated and viewed, um, through that, um, it was very eye opening. I, I know we kind of touched on that a little bit in previous episodes, like especially with Prisca, we talked about with you, what it was like, you know, being uh, multiracial within your youth group and everything and how mm-hmm. people kind of like have that as a running joke and, and all of that. And right. um, people who are in minorities are just expected to accept that and to take those sort of jokes. Um, yeah. 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 And, and you know, and it, it's not like they're extremely hurtful, but they're grading over time, right. you know? Um, but I, I know several people within the church I grew up with that were gay that just like stuck out of as a sore thumb, um, even though they didn't want, to be that way, mm-hmm. you know, and how hurtful it was to be seen as somebody who was different. Um, and then on top of that, to be told that, oh, we chose, we chose to be oh, yeah. different yeah, yeah. when it's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like we did not and choose see, our that's sexuality. The thing for me is that like, you, like the only way that you can maintain that kind of teaching and get that many people to buy it mm-hmm. is if you have this safe little cove where there's nobody like there are very few people that can object right absolutely because you you just can't like nobody believes that it's a choice anymore that's in their right mind that is a member of society right right because we've all met enough gay people to be like oh yeah these people did not choose to be alienated by society. It just happened to them. Like, and we need to, you know, I was in a, um, there was this recently, uh, well, I guess it wasn't even that recently. It was like a couple of years ago. I was invited to be, uh, sort of the, I was like the resident atheist on this board, on this discussion yes, board. Yes, yes. Did I tell you about this before? Yeah, I think you mentioned on and, or on uh, one of the episodes. And before, the turning but... point, yeah, the turning point for me again was like, uh, and I think I, I think I did say this on the show before, but uh, the the turning point for the on the conversation for me, like everything was reasonable until we started talking about homosexuality, and I said these people are don't choose this, like they you don't choose to be gay, mm-hmm. and they and everybody in the room was like, oh well, you don't know that, and I was like. Where am I? Wait, wh- who, you like how can right. you exist in the world with the internet and like still believe that? How is that possible? And it's because they they just go to their safe little coves where they don't have to confront the issue of homosexuality. Like my I'm sitting there like my roommate's gay, you know, mm-hmm. like and he's one of my best friends. And when he says it wasn't a choice, I believe him because right. I'm not an asshole, you mm-hmm. know. But it's so easy when you you go to this place where ignorance is the norm and you get your beliefs reinforced over and over and over again. And that's the problem with with homogeneity in any setting is like 
you're like ignorance is you know like you, you if you're in an all white environment all the time it's easy to demonize people of other ethnicities because you don't know any and you're never your belief of that is never challenged because you the lack of exposure you know and uh, a friend of mine uh, there's a coworker that i have who was brought up very evangelical and he recently has been going through his his garage and cleaning it out and so i'm occasionally getting these messages from him on facebook of like brady look at this crazy shit that i found you know yeah, yeah. and one of them was a new testament bible that also had these like really propaganda e cartoons like comic uh-huh. strips uh-huh. about you know different things that the youth of today are going to have to face and oh, one of them yeah. was like this coach <laughs> and he was going through uh talking about homosexuality to one of his is uh one of his students or whatever uh let me read you some of this i, yeah, I, yeah. I think that Let's it's it. it's really crazy um it says uh <laughs> let me let me find the right one um this is what the coach said he says um that's what the homosexuals want you to believe oh he says uh, yeah this is where it gets good so this is a conversation between uh joey and the unified unit that is homosexuals that that are on this have this agenda right yeah yeah so the coach says uh what joey feeling strange and confused is perfectly natural for a teenager but it doesn't mean you're a pervert and he says a pervert but tom said there's no difference between gay and straight people and the coach says that's what the homosexual want you to believe and there's a dark side to their lifestyle they'd rather you didn't know about oh and, the, and the kid's like you mean AIDS and the, and the coach <laughs> says the truth is that homosexuality is the cause of AIDS it's the deadly consequence for violating God's oh word God. but their perversion hurts others too and the kid says how and he says when you break God's law it means it leads more to sin many homosexuals become child molesters oh my God. and the guy says well Tom didn't tell me about that and he was even telling me about this other one that it's just they start to throw all of this it's propaganda like if yeah. you look at that and you compare it to like what the nazis did with nazis like yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah. even the same artist Format. yeah right, right? artist who's yeah. doing the shit and um but you're right when you get people around to all look the same and they all believe the same it's easy for them to perpetuate these lies um without having any input of the people who they are falsely representing and um, you do that for enough generations, and, and we have what we're living in today, right. the society that we're living in today, yeah. where Trump is considered a, a Christian leader and has all these, like, you know, Paula White is all of a sudden relevant again, and the Copelands, and yeah. all these people are in his religion. Yeah. It's just out, it's outrageous. It's outrageous, and it's um, it's disgusting. It, uh, yeah, and, you know, it, it, it goes in, it plays into uh, indoctrination and sort of how the... Um, Christian faith is, you know, uh, sort of maintained as a viable explanation for how the world is, right? Because it's not practical in those (laughs) homogenous, I can say words, (laughs) it's not practical in those homogenous environments to constantly be introducing like, well, this is what Hindus believe, and this is what skeptics and atheists believe, and this is, you know, it's not... They're more interested in perpetuating the the system that they have. Whereas, like when you're outside of faith, you're sort of like taking in bits of information from all kinds of different worlds, um, and it causes you to to ask difficult questions about what you believe and reform what you believe. But when mm-hmm. you're just constantly, you have a set of presuppositions. The Bible is true. Well, everybody here believes the Bible's true, so we're going to teach what the Bible says. But right. but you're never welcomed into questioning. Well, is the Bible true? You know, mm-hmm. at least not consistently. And it might be like a once a year thing where they're like, "Hey, the Bible might not be true, but we're going to prove how it is true." Let's listen to some Ravi Zacharias, right? Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And but and but none of those really, not nothing. None of those things encourage you to look up how come the story of of what is his name horus you know in egyptian <laughs> culture is just like jesus right, but came right. you know or why are there all these other stories that were older than the bible that happened it's you know like all these different things yeah they're not encouraging you to look those up they're mm-hmm. just going to give you these propagandized answers yep. to questions that they get a form and they get to control the entire the entire conversation so but, go ahead well i was going to say i i know um our guest today is has great experience in all of these things because he um, has had to deal with them as well. And, and I'm looking forward to kind of hearing what our guest today has to say. Word. 
Yeah. Let's get to it. Um, when we get back, we are going to hear from Verdell. And uh, Verdell is amazing. He emailed the show. Uh, we read his email and realized we really need to get his voice in the show because I know he's going to have some really enlightening things for us to hear today. Um, so we'll be right back after this. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, we are here with Verdell. Yep. And, and Chuck and Brady. <laughs> Chuck and Brady. Hey, Verdell, uh, say hello to our audience. Uh, hello, everybody. Yourself. Hey, uh, Verdell, where, where do you live? What do you do? Um, I live right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I am a writer, an editor, um, done some consulting work on a lot of progressive um, political campaigns, a lot of advocacy work, things like that, you know, typical D.C. stuff. So Yeah, cool. And what area did you grow up in? I grew up in um, Asbury Park, New Jersey, right on the Jersey Shore. Oh, oh yeah, I've heard of that. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited Shore. about that. <laughs> right? I'm not. Yeah, I, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know why though, because I've never, <laughs> I've never cared watched, about the show I've or never seen it. I've never seen it. <laughs> Confession. It's a point of familiarity, I guess. Um, that show promoted so many horrible immoral, immoral values. There, get off, off my get off my podcast. <laughs> Get off my podcast. As someone who grew up in New Jersey, the first season was probably the one that was the somewhat closest to reality, if you uh-huh. want to say that. Yeah. After that, it just no. I it mean, just, even the first season was still kind of like, okay, yeah, no, but right, right, right. the first season was more like, okay, like I could see, like I went to Rutgers with people who may have been like this. There are people who like this right. at the beach, but even even that was a stretch. But after that, it was just like, okay, yeah, no. <laughs> Um, tell us what it was like growing up. Like, what was your church like in your church life? Ironically, well, not ironically, I don't know. I'm using that word wrong, but, um, I did not grow up in church. I would say that I grew up around church. Ooh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so my grandmother was seventh day Adventist. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So she went to church a lot. And so, and we lived all in the same town. As park is like one square mile. You can walk from one into the other and, 20, 30 minutes. Okay. And so, you know, when we lived there, we would, you know, my grandmother was like the second mom. And so if my mom and my dad went around, I was with her. And so, you know, she would read us Bible studies and little things like that. And she would show us, I don't know what, if they weren't watchtowers, it's actually what Jehovah's Witness, but right. um, the, the seven day Adventist folders with the, like, you know, you had like the, with heaven in the background and the rainbow and the green grass uh-huh. and oh, you yes. had the, yes. the white person playing with the tiger and the black person <laughs> and the Chinese person and everybody's happy, <laughs> um, stuff like that. And so I grew up around that. Um, mm-hmm. and my mom actually wanted to start taking us to church, but I just did not want to go. Uh-huh. I was like, no, I don't want to go. I think this is stupid. Right. Um, it seems like a waste of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you and, you were uh, were you like a little kid at that point? Like you I were, was young. I yeah, was very, yeah. So I you didn't had, get it. So you knew what was up. You. <laughs> well, I think the thing about it, God and spirituality was interesting to me. I remember praying when I was very young. Like I couldn't have been any more than four years old, and I praying. My mom. I, I think I just recently learned that my mom was having my sister, or mm-hmm. at least was pregnant, and so I prayed for an older brother, as if. Right. The person, as if the baby she would have was somebody be older than me. Sure. But whatever. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I was trusting God to do a miracle. Right, right, uh, definitely. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Okay. I noticed that my grandmother, she she went to church and it was very important to her, but I also noticed that it was like, wait a minute, you never seem to say anything positive about these people. They're always doing something. Mm. They seem to be annoying. They seem to be aggravating, not really helping. Also, so the event is, the, you know, they went to church on Saturday mm-hmm. and that's when, you know, back in the day when Saturday cartoons were really oh, like, Oh yeah, no, you're yes. not going to miss Saturday it's, cartoons. Nope. And nope. just the idea of missing, I was like, you want me to miss 
the best part of the week. Right, was right. that like Tiny Toons and Animaniac era? I mean, a little before that. We're talking like the tail end of Thundercats. Oh, and yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 In all, all that that era, like uh-huh. Silver Hawks and Super Mario Brothers 3. Yeah. The good, oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about Super Mario Brothers. So yeah. All, all that type of stuff and it was just like no i'm not but my, I, I credit my dad because my dad said to my mom from my understanding is that you know don't make him go because this isn't necessarily something where he he doesn't have to go he uh-huh. really doesn't want to and if you force him to go now at when he's older he won't do it and so right, you're kind of right. taking the choice away from him by forcing him to go hmm. um and that was pretty smart um, in, yeah. a, in a lot of ways, I think. I mean, we went to vacation Bible school. Um, I went there a couple of times to my grandmother's church, and um, there was a Catholic school, a Catholic church in town that had a Bible school, and the Episcopal school that had a, a you know, in, in 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 urban areas, particularly where there's low income, you go to a lot of summer camps run by churches and, and schools and, and all of that. And so I so I had enough experience with it. But I was always around. It was always this assumption that, oh, well, one day you're going to, you know, be a preacher or something. Because it's hmm. it's common that if there's a – usually it, 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 it's it, it's a boy. Usually that's not said about women still. Right, but right. But if you're a boy and you're well-behaved and you happen to be smart and you're somewhere near a church, it's somehow – it, it tends to be, oh, well, God has a calling all your life. You're going to uh-huh, be something. Uh-huh. So, yeah, yeah. So, so how did you move from um, – how did you move from like being sort of like uh, not really going to church, not being forced to go to church? At some point, you got pretty committed to the whole movement, right? I mean, eventually you ended up in seminary and all that stuff. What was the, what was the transition? How did you get so involved? So I was open, and I met. I think freshman year of school, I met and, and at Rutgers, I met some really cool people, and they were fun. Like they were really great. Um, some of the you know really really cool people that i at that point in time i had not met people like this and and, you know in in my life and so what happened was it was a church uh uh, still it's still there a pretty notable mega church for a mega church for up north i would say Mm -hmm. um it was a pretty sizable church up, up the street from rutgers university and so some of my you know some of the folks on my floor started going and she invited me i was like okay yeah sure fine i'll go and the way the pastor explained it was very nice. The music was nice. It was bright colors. People seemed to be happy to see you. It was so vibrant. And the way that he explained salvation, people were wearing regular clothes. And so everything that I hated about church at that time was gone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it was like, okay, sure. Like, it was no tears. I was not moved or anything like that. It was just, oh, wow, sure. Looking back. Now I see that I, I was kind of thinking that maybe that would make a difference in my life. I used to feel very isolated, very alone, and that maybe it was something to this Jesus thing. If these cool people were doing it, then maybe I should too. Mm-hmm. And so I did it, and I did. I met some other cool people, and it, it snowballed from there. And I, I, I mean, I think because I did not grow up in church, and because my decision to do it was really probably the biggest decision that i made on my own besides taking out thousands of dollars to go to school mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you know at that young age right right uh, i think that um because I, it was my personal decision i took it maybe saying it more seriously is not the right way but i took it like it, it wasn't it wasn't just something that i did like i really meant it mm-hmm. okay yeah. Yeah. So I was at that time i get you yeah i took it very seriously probably even more seriously than people who were already involved in it Mm-hmm. Not all, but for a decent amount, it was like, no, I really mean this thing. I want to, you know, learn who Jesus is. I want to learn about prayer. And, I mean, that's how I was about everything, you know, growing up. Like, I, dinosaurs, I loved it, so I got all the books. And uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, uh-huh. Got all the books. I always wanted to know behind the scenes about how this stuff actually works. And so I applied the same thing to my faith at the time. Right, right. That's interesting because I've noticed with a lot of our listeners, um, you know, in our Life After community group on, on Facebook, that there's so many of our listeners who when they described themselves as Christians, it was, they were some of the most committed ones that they knew in their church. You know what I mean? And so it's interesting to see that a lot of us who really did take it seem seemingly take it more serious than the other words, other people around us um, are now the ones who are, you know, exiting. Right. I say it all the time. Like I've, 
I mean, I really took it seriously. I did that. I joined a Christian fraternity. I was in, mm-hmm. um, I was in Christian leadership on campus. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I was involved, deeply, deeply involved. And I think one thing that people miss is that people usually, people who lose or, or stop believing or whatever you want to call it, often the, the conversation is, oh, well, something happened to you or maybe you were taking something seriously or if you just read the right thing or the right thing happens, you'll be back. Mm-hmm. And in reality, it's like um, a lot of people, them not having faith is the most intellectually and emotionally honest thing they can say for where yes, they are. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think that's the thing that people, even people who are sympathetic to it, I think it, this is like, no, I'm not just somebody who, oh, well, I had a bad day. And so I said, you know, the hell of Jesus. It's like, I have more <laughs> theological education than most pastors ever will have. Right, right, right. I've Yep. I've been in most of the church situations. I've been involved with high church, low church, Pentecostal, evangelical, mm-hmm. conservative, traditional, mainline, uh, progressive. I've been I've been around the block several <laughs> times in several cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so it's not like some. I think people think like, oh well, you know, if you just think it, it's like almost like they see it as as a lapse in judgment. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. When the reality is like, no, this is honestly the best given my experience and and yeah emotional too but given my experience my understanding this is the best posture that i can put myself in right to faith based off what i know and what i've experienced i like the it, way you worded it when you were talking to us uh, or and in, in, in your questionnaire when you said uh, i pushed through spirituality or like you, you have, you have basically. I'm trying to think of the. Yeah, you said you pushed beyond faith. That's sort of the way that you you described it. So it's like you experienced that realm, and you got to the end of it, and we're like, okay, I'm. I guess I'll keep keep walking. You know what I mean? You, you get what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. It's so. It. I still. I'm starting to be able to put more words to it now. Mm-hmm. But it happened without my permission. I didn't really ask for it. I wasn't really seeking for it to happen. Um, I think just a lot of little things added up, and eventually I was just kind of found like, just like, okay, yeah, no, this isn't, this just doesn't. I mean, I have people ask me now, well, what do you believe? I said, well, I have faith in myself. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like that's really, I have faith in myself. I have faith in what we can do if we all can, you know, unite together and work together for good. I have faith in that. Mm-hmm. But, but, and for me, I still think I'm a very religious person. I don't equate religion with belief mm-hmm. in okay. God. Mm-hmm. Um, those two things are separate um, because, like, Buddha is, is a religion. Buddhism, right, right. Is there's no, much a religion, yeah. but there's no god. It's an you know what I mean? I think, religion, yeah. Yeah, and Buddhism is great. I like Buddhism a lot. Um, you know, Stoicism, you, you know, too. I mean, I read uh-huh. a, a bunch of that. I mean, there, there's they talk about God, but it's not the same thing that you know, right? You know that that we would would think about. Um, but for me, the notion of, and I guess we'll talk get to this later. Uh, but just the notion of a God who I can pray to that if I do, if, if I don't want to say any, I don't want to sound like derogatory or, or like I'm demeaning, but if the magical marbles roll my way, mm-hmm. right. And, and I'm saying mm-hmm. this to someone who used to believe this. So and maybe that takes away the, the derogatory part of it. Like mm-hmm. I used to honestly deeply believe uh-huh. this. So this isn't, this isn't just somebody berating people who pray and saying that oh they're all dumb and stupid because i used to do this too very much so for more of my i live more of my life like that than i have like this Mm -hmm. (laughs) so if the magical marbles have to roll your way in order for you to get what you want right um and, and no matter how you rationalize it like even if you say oh well you know god's not a genie you have to work for it why am i talking to god then right if, if God's if God won't respond to me, even saying that he's not a genie to try to clean it up a little bit, which I get. At the same time, though, what's the point of talking? What's the point of having a parent if they won't do anything for you? Mm-hmm. And when I began to realize that, wait a minute, my own parents treat me better than God does. Uh huh. Right. God always has an excuse for why God doesn't do something. It's always it's yeah. always yes. the reason why God is off the hook. And for me, that's just for personal reasons and cultural reasons and societal reasons. To me, that's just not a. There's no answer that's good enough for me. Absolutely, right. I, I think about that a lot. If if every answer always gets God off the hook, but always pushes us more down on it, you know, and it's kind of like. 
God, I did, that's one thing that like started to make me get away from the faith was to think like, okay, I have no proof that God is real, um, but I have to prove myself to show that I'm faithful. And right. it's always in that direction. It's always that I'm giving it's more. It's always more, a one way street. Yeah. And he's not doing anything, but we always have these answers to, to cover up for him. Like, Oh, well saying no is an answer to prayer. So he's answering your prayer. The answer is just no. Yeah. Or, you know, who are you to question? And there's all these things that just like cause you to kind of like gaslight on God's behalf to defend him from our own questions that keep us from really getting the answers that we need. And yeah. That we deserve that we should be asking but we're told that we shouldn't be asking them so we stop eventually i always kind of think of the the flip side of that too like you said like when the magic marbles land in your favor it's like what like what are the implications of like if god is on our side right Mm -hmm. and a good thing happens because god favors us then what are the implications of like really bad things happening to good people you know and like scenarios like that uh, yeah, people act as if the the Aussie question, because that's what is this, you know, a big, there's a big $20 seminary word, um, the, the Aussie question, why do bad things happen to good people? It actually hasn't been answered. There is no good answer. Right. No, there isn't. Every, there really isn't. Like, like every answer sucks. Every yep. answer is terrible. And even if, like, how do they put it? Either God is all good or all powerful. God can't be both. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, yeah, um, exactly. And, and honestly, I don't have an interest, particularly in the, in you know, black theology tradition, the idea of God being one of us, God being on our side, you know, the God of the oppressed, like, you know, Howard mm-hmm. Thurman would say, I'm not interested in the God who's on my side, but can't rescue me. I don't want a buddy. I don't want a friend. Right. I want you to, I want you to, to rescue me. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that was really the core. I think to what makes it difficult is that when you understand the root like we understand how religion works, not just from a faith perspective, but like from an academic social science thing that humans do perspective. Mm-hmm. It's challenging because the ancient Israelites, it wasn't metaphoric. It was like deliver and really meant we're enslaved, break the chains, bring us somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was their, right. yeah, yeah, that was their idea of mm-hmm. deliverance. We won the battle. We have the food. Our victor, you know, our enemies are dead. Like it was a very tangible idea because there was no afterlife, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so right. well, well, not in the sense that we think of it. Like it, they, it wasn't like you go to heaven or hell. It wasn't like that for them, and so everything that they experienced, they had the experience while they were alive. Right, and so yep. it's a very tangible thing there. Um, and so now it's like, oh well, God, maybe you know the the no is what you need. It's like no, that person who was dying of cancer didn't need a no. Right. I'm pretty sure, like if my if my parents saw me living healthy and said, "Hmm, maybe I think that Junior needs to learn to trust us better." So what I'll do is I'll stop feeding him. Right, 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 right. I'll put him outside, right outside the door, and will not let him in. He can experience all the elements, and I will teach him how to trust me better. And once he gets it, and if he's just near death. I'll let him back in and I'll bless him. Right. That is so, that's so poignant. That's so good because that's abusive behavior. You know, like if some parents did that, you'd be like, that's not okay. We're going to take your children away from you now. Yeah. Like we call every social service agency we could. <laughs> right. God. Right. But, yeah, but, but God, it's okay for God because God has a bigger, grander yeah, yeah. purpose. Yeah. And it just, it's, I, I do know that there are reasonable responses to that for people who still have faith and I don't denigrate them. For me, I do not think there is a good response. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested. I agree. If, if God is that amoral that he can't figure out that, hey, some things are good and some things are bad, I'm not interested. Mm-hmm. I'm also not interested in the God who's just a buddy and the pal to get to sing to me when I go through rough times. Mm-hmm. Not really interested in that either, because if you're God, can't you do something? Like, yeah, I do sure. things for yeah. my friends yeah, within yeah. my power. I, I think, ironically, now I'm using the word right for a change. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, my ideas about God changed once I understood what love really was. Wow. Which is strange because just everybody says that God, for the Christian, you know, God is love, right? Mm-hmm. And when I realized what love should be like, it made God harder to mm-hmm. take seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Because if you love me, you wouldn't do those things to me. Mm-hmm. Like, my partner does not treat me 
my partner has no way the power of God. That would be nice, but no, he doesn't. Mm -hmm. But he takes care of me. If he sees something that's happening to me and he can help me, he does. I don't have to beg him. Right. I don't have to remind him of how great he is. Right. I don't have, I don't have to, I don't have to boost his ego up. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're the best. There's none like you. I don't have to do that for him to take care of me. Right. To help me. When you said uh, I was thinking of Jigsaw from the um, the Saw movies, where it's like, you know, you could say that Jigsaw is loving his victims because he's teaching them a lesson to appreciate their life more. <laughs> right. But they still have to, like, you know, dig a key out of their eye socket. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. to get to that lesson. And it I, that's not love. That's just it's weird-ass manipulation. It's the Job test. That's what I call it. For me... If you can understand how people view the story of Job or how they view the cross, mm -hmm. then it says a lot about what they think. Then that's oh, what I've experienced. Oh, that's mm. interesting. Like a litmus test for where you are with religiosity. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. If you think that Job is the best story in the world and it's an encouraging thing about faith, yeah. you're probably going to at some point hear some interesting <laughs> stuff that will make you scream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need to take a break. Uh, when we get back, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Verdell's uh, deconstruction. So we'll be right back after this. Cool. And we're back. Welcome. Um, Verdell, what was kind of like the next step for you then? You're here you are at Rutgers. Um, and what, what kind of made you go into divinity school? What was your, your jump there? What was your plan? Your, your, your overarching plan? Well, you know, like most people do, I was trying to figure out what I was going to actually do with my life. And so I had the idea of, Oh, you know, I'll, you know, go to school. And I thought that I, I felt that I was a, supposed to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. I felt that that's what people like me should do. And so I wanted to go to school to learn. Now, my first forays were looking into, I mean, I, I was in a situation where I was kind of cross pollinated. So I was in a very black, a very black charismatic space, but they were also very big on the spiritual gifts, like speaking in tongues and prophecy and healing, all that type of stuff. And so that also involved with me, um, like looking into things like um, um, International House of Prayer. Um, I, I liked them a lot because I, I'm very booky. And so if you give me something to read, I'm going to go and read it and learn okay. it and come back and do it. And so um, a lot of, a lo how do I say this? A lot of what I've experienced is a lot of white churches tend to have materials like that more readily available. Okay. And it's not and it's and it's not because black people don't like to read or anything like that. Of course not. It's just that books and things like that are particularly as big a part of our faith tradition. Even though like the Bible is really, really important. It's not a emphasis on memorizing scripture and verse type of thing. Like we don't really even though I've done that, <laughs> but it's not that it's not the same. And so the, the being able to hold something and to dig deep, um, you know, to, 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 to learn things like to, be able to pick up a book by Lester Summerall or to be able to read Smith Wigglesworth, right? Okay. Yeah. And learn things that it seemed like in churches that I was in, you had to be close to the pastor to even think about. And so it was really cool to go and say, oh, well, wait, I can go and read all these. I can go read like John G. Lake and... Smith Wigglesworth and Lester Summerall and Amy Simple McPherson. You see, I can rattle off all these names. Right, right, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and so it was cool to be able to say and go and read these people. So that means I could have, I could take the practice onto myself and and go for what I, and, and get out of it what I wanted to get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that led to that. Um, I eventually moved down here to, to, the, to the D.C. area after I graduated and worked a lot of, you know, odd jobs between graduation and that because it was right when, you know, not long before the depression, the recession rather started oh, yeah. and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my fraternity brothers, a bunch of my fraternity brothers went to Howard University. 
And then one of when they graduated, one of them went to Howard University School of Divinity. Okay. And I didn't know that Howard had a divinity school. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what divinity school was. All I knew was that, oh, okay, this is something that I wanted to do. Let's see if I can make this happen. Mm-hmm. And so I applied and I got in. I had no idea what I was signing up for. None. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't know there was between like a place like an IHOP or, you know, a Rhema school uh-huh. or a divinity school. I had no idea. All I knew was like, oh, religion, God, faith. And it didn't really bother me for a while because I had a, my minor undergrad was religion. Uh huh. So yeah. talking about Jesus and the Jesus seminar and all the academic terms, world religions, it didn't bother me. But also because I, yes, my thought process was severely impacted by faith, but it was still a little bit of indoctrination that I missed. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. That yeah, I think yeah. enabled me, and I had enough experience with other people. I was still a mess, and probably still a jerk. I'm sure, uh-huh. um, as, uh-huh. as, as as most Christians like that are. Right. Totally. But I was I was missing just enough indoctrination to be able to do just enough thinking on my own to wiggle into some different positions that other people probably sure, couldn't do. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, you probably you weren't you weren't uh you weren't like hyper exposed at that really young age, so you it wasn't as <laughs> it wasn't it didn't quite have its claws in, right? Right. And I didn't I mean, like I said, my mom started going to church and my dad too when I was very much an adult in my thirties. Like late twenties, early thirties, and so I didn't have I didn't stand the risk of losing family members because I didn't go to church. Like there were so many things that were in my favor that allowed me to explore um, mm-hmm. that other people usually don't have. So uh, you get so you get into this divinity school, right? Is that cr- mm-hmm. okay? Cool. So you get into this divinity school, and you're uh, are you you're not out at this point, right? I mean, no. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. So so what was your uh, what was your experience of the? Because a lot of what plays into our story, based ba- uh, your story, based on what you told us, is sort of this like uh, this weird like being the black gay guy. What what is your experience with that yet? Is that something that you're wrestling with at this point? Are you? Is it sort of to the side? Are you? Uh, do you feel alienated in your space? Like what? Where where are you with that right now? So. One day I want to write extensively about this because it was a very tricky time. I started Divinity School the spring of 2009 in D.C. when um, same-sex marriage was a big deal being argued very heavily Mm -hmm. in the district. Um, And then a couple years later, it was argued heavily in Maryland. And so it was a very, very intense time. Um, We had a dean who had just came to the school who had been open in his support for same-sex marriage. Um, we had several professors at the school who wrote some that declaration, not as like saying Howard University, but saying that, you know, these are professors who have their own careers, or whatever, who are saying that same sex marriage is fine. It's not a sin. Mm-hmm. Well, that didn't go over so well. And so there were protests. People sent countless letters to the school. Like you had in order to get to the school, you had to go through protesters. Oh, man. Um, and at oh, the time, man. there was a friend of mine who, who was out. He was like the... He was like the gay out person to be, you know, at that point in time. And he used to just get such, he used to get reamed every day, like Man. in the classes and the arguments every day in class. It became like the lightning rod for that, right? Yeah. And it was, it was really rough to watch and people arguing left and right. And again, everybody looks and everybody for the most part is black. So there, there's these really rough arguments every day. Somebody even drew stuff like his his a stick figure with his physical features that way you knew it was him and a noose around his neck, you know, oh and God. things like that. And so it was like, okay, there's really no white people here, so someone who did this had to have been black. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's no it, <laughs> like the all the white people I know who have gone to Howard that I know of are all like super left like super to the left uh-huh. and so it was just like yeah someone black drew this <laughs> like, uh-huh. this is really terrible yeah but seeing i was looking back i was going through my own struggles not really being able to name them just yet and they became more pronounced as i went through seminary and then went to a you know to an, an, uh, an actual seminary after that um but being around the intense homophobia did have an impact on me. Mm-hmm. Um, hearing how, hearing the, the the strange thing, I think this is where the cultural thing comes up too. Divinity School is one of the few places, particularly if we're talking about a black 
you know, seminary, and I, that's with HBCU. This is one of the few times when a pastor is on the same level as everybody else. Mm. And so pastor so-and-so who's been preaching for 10 years has a church of 30,000 members, of, um, however many. Right. He and I have the same homework. Uh-huh. Okay. And he, yeah. And he's not, he's not Pastor Charles. He's, he's not Pastor Williams. Uh-huh. He's Charles. Interesting. Yeah. And I'm you know, and it, and that dynamic makes a difference. And it's just, it, it was very intense. And now you have professors who were for it and against it, and that seeped out into things. And it was just, it was a mess. And so I think even though it wasn't until... It wasn't until almost the end, like I would say the last year of me being at the school when I was actually able to be honest. I am lying. Wait a minute. Ooh, Monkey wrench. Back it up. <laughs> so I, a good friend of mine, I want to say the Thanksgiving before I went to school, asked me. He said he noticed, which in a way it was like, okay, did he have like gaydar or something? Because uh-huh. it was weird. It's like, wait, looking back, it's like, wait, how did you... And I don't, maybe, I don't know. I mean, we're still good friends to this day. Mm-hmm. But he asked me, and I was like, yeah, I guess. He's like, yeah, do you struggle or whatever? I don't really know. Like, mm-hmm. he just called it out. And I guess because we had to have a relationship, like, we would just talk about everything. Yeah, yeah. And so he, called, he, like, called it out. And it was just kind of like, and that's when I kind of like, that's the first time I actually admitted it to, like, and I remember that time asking a friend who again decent friend did his best but he was saying something about you know men giving people hugs and that really hurt my feeling sure yeah and i he was like that was one of the first people that i actually told that's like okay yeah it's something i'm rest or you know people say i'm struggling yeah struggling i mean yeah and so yeah so but then when that happened i kind of put all that away for a few years until almost in a seminary mm. so yeah i had to add that sorry right. no, so no, you, no, no, you were trying fair, to figure yeah. yourself yeah, out yeah. through that whole process i mean it's a it's a hard thing to when it's the norm to be straight you know and you start to kind of realize that you view things in a different way and you view friendships in a different way and everything like that you, it's just like little pieces of puzzle that you have to put together and realize oh i'm maybe different than how other people or acting or behaving or how they think. That was how yeah. it was for me, at least. It's like someone took a puzzle and scattered the pieces. It's like you're playing, like, it's like the worst RPG ever. And <laughs> right. It's, it's, right. It's, it's, it's secret side quests and puzzle pieces everywhere. And yeah. you're just scrambling mm-hmm. around. And hopefully you'll find enough to yeah. beat the game. Hopefully you'll find enough to, to do something significant. Maybe. But it took a long time. And I had very little help. Um, I just had to really just, yeah, just, it, it was a long, long, long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Verdell, so, okay. So rolling back a little bit, you were in, so you were in, uh, seminary at Howard and you mm-hmm. eventually decided to go to a different seminary and your story kind of, kind of progresses from there. Uh, mm-hmm. where, where do we, where, what, uh, why, why did you change seminaries first of all? Or I guess like divinity schools. Oh, I didn't change. I graduated. From oh, you graduated. Our, okay. So you just needed more, you just need more yeah. school and more so loans. I wanted, I figured out that I wanted to do a PhD toward like maybe the, and I had like about a year and a half left at Howard. And so a professor of mine who was a, a mentor made up a plan for me and we said, okay, well, what was common for people to do an NTS in the middle? Mm-hmm. And so I got to skip a lot because I already had an MDiv. I just wanted to prove that I could do writing and research because none of my program was set up. Like, it, I could have if we did it earlier, but I just didn't. And right, right, right. It was a time when everybody wanted to go get PhDs, and so they were telling everybody, no, no, no. But they were like, oh, no, you actually can do it, so you should try. Okay. Um, and so I, that's what led me to Wesley Theological Seminary. Okay. Oh, mm-hmm. Wesley Theological. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Ooh. So, And I was actually, we'll see. Okay, here's the other part of the story. I was African-American Episcopal for a decent amount of time when I was at Howard. Uh-huh. Eventually, I left for a number of reasons. And I became United Methodist. And, okay. um, and Wesley Theological Seminary is a Methodist seminary. Um, and that's where, I would say, if we're talking about, let's say, my de- deconstruction and my process, I think my deconstruction has been the result of 
experiencing enough of each iteration of the Christian faith. Yes. Yeah. And, ex- and, and experiencing the good stuff, but then eventually having the bad stuff outweigh the good. Uh-huh. To the point when I was like, okay, there's nothing left that's here. Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems like you have been, you've been in every sort of like spectrum of Christianity at some point. You've been in conservative, you've been in charismatic settings, you've been in, uh, you know, pretty left, like Episcopal sort of United Methodist settings, like, and, and you sort of surveyed everything, right? Mm-hmm. I've had a, I've seen a lot. Um, I've ex- been exposed to a lot. Yeah. And I have this blessing or curse, depending on how you put it, to, of sitting back and, if, if I'm not honest with anyone else, I'm going to be honest with me. Right. And at some point, I'm going to have to respond to my to what I have discovered. And I think that's what it was for me. I remember, and it's been just little things. Like, it was a big deal when I was at, at when I was at Wesley is when, and, and, and when I, you know, made my official coming out, if you will. Um, but then being sacked in the middle of an ordination process and then, you know, talking to other folks who are in the process and who are also gay, and we're just like, we know, well, it doesn't really matter. No one really asked you. That's not that big a deal. And this is the other thing, too, is that for me, I did not, I did not see ministry as a career. Uh huh. In a lot of ways, it is, but That's... I saw it as a calling. And so for right. me, I did not see how I could compromise. I thought that a big part of why my ministry quote unquote would be useful is my integrity and my authenticity. Okay. And yeah. I thought that I would have to do too much lying that, that the lying that the way I'd have to play side of hand would somehow ruin my integrity. Right. 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 And so I, and so I left and a lot of people thought I was stupid for doing it. And they're like, why are you doing that? And, and that was around, I was paid to some people who were like really big movers and shakers in the, in the United Methodist church. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was smart and and young and 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 a person of color. All those things, you know, was like, oh yay, more of this, please. And so they're like, well, just to say no to all that, and and a pretty good preacher. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like everyone that I preach for has said, wow, you're awesome. We're inviting you back. So I guess that said something. Right, right, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so to give that up really started a chain reaction. In some ways, a bad thing. Actually, it impacts my opinion of coming out because. I lost a lot. I lost a whole lot. And I yeah. think that's the other part mm. of the story that often isn't told as much that I lost networks. I lost money. I lost oh, jobs. Yeah, yeah, I had yeah. to throw out half of my belongings because I could not carry them with me on the bus. I had to move back home wow. and live in my room that at, in my teenage room yeah. for a few yeah, months yeah. because, you know, because I didn't have anything like oh, I was done. God. Like, And so, the idea of, oh, everybody rush and come out because you'll be free. No, no. I lost a lot. I'm yeah. still recovering mm-hmm. in many yeah. ways from all of that type of stuff. Um, stuff has not been, there's a lack of stability that has existed since that moment, to be honest. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a part of the coming out story that we aren't honest enough about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, yeah. you know, when, we're, when we urge people to come on out, show your light, be who you are kind of hard to be who you are if you're homeless sis so yeah we touch on that a little bit in this show just from like i guess my experience because yeah yeah. you know because i went straight from going into the ministry to um losing my my wife and having my kid half time and uh not having the ability to go back to school and so i mean there's like a feeling that i have of like feeling stuck where i am now because my degrees i'm an atheist with a bible degree (laughs) you know what i mean and uh, i'm a single dad too so it's like i don't really have the time or the resources to go back to school and to better myself so um i'm just trying to like fill in through the cracks and to get into where I can and to do what I can. And, um, I'm hoping that somehow telling my story on a flipping podcast will somehow open doors in the future. <laughs> you know what I mean? So no, I totally know where you're at there. It's, uh, yeah. it's not an easy place to be in, is it? No. And I think that, I mean, the one, I guess, saving grace is that I have like, you know, an actual, like I have a master's degree and so mm-hmm. I can lead with that and say like, you know, I have actual, you know, I have these, so I can say that, but still, it's just, it's the way, like, a lot of church stuff, 
because you're so isolated, <clears throat> if you were to ever leave, you have so much catching up to do mm-hmm. that it's almost impossible to gain that to, to gain your footing. Like mm-hmm. it's so many things yeah. that you just don't know how to navigate through or don't have the capacity to navigate through because you would you did so much like you know so much of my career was wrapped up like i did not i did not think i would you know i was planning and thoughtful as thoughtful as i could be you know for for a kid you know what i mean and i mean it's you know i'm only 34 so i'm calling my 24 year old self a kid but (laughs) uh, but it's you know, given where I came from and my circumstances, I did the best that I could do. I probably yeah. overachieved in a lot of ways. Absolutely, yeah. And so, so it's not like I went into this, you know, without thinking. But she said I did not anticipate these experiences mm-hmm. happening to me. Mm-hmm. And so now I have this training. Like, there are lots of ways that I can parlay my ministry and pastoral training. And I think it's only because I can say, oh, I have a, master- I have a Howard University degree. Mm-hmm. right because mm-hmm. i have an actual degree like i don't have one from like you know yeah um uh, so-and-so bible school Southern co- and or something yeah yeah so, i yeah. can say that i have a howard university degree and so that gives me something but yeah it wasn't for that i mean even still it's still rough but yeah it's you get you get trapped in a certain mode and then if you ever leave you don't necessarily you have to develop the tools to navigate other people in other situations and no one is willing to stop to teach you. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because they assume that, Oh, you're an adult. You should know all this stuff by now. Yeah. But there's so many other things that you honestly don't know. Like, I think it's like, no, no, like the whole idea, I had to really get over the idea of late bloomer because it was like, I'm not late. I just never had the chance to figure it out. I never yeah. had the opportunity to. Mm-hmm. And some things that probably wouldn't have been safe to figure out. Like, I think if I were an openly gay kid, at 15, 16, it, I probably either would have committed suicide or I would have mm. jumped in the back of the car of the first older guy that showed me attention mm. because I felt mm-hmm. so alone and so everything. Mm-hmm. And so he would have been like, you're not like the other guys. You're so smart. Don't you want to come with me? And I would have left forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have yeah. gone. <laughs> so yeah. in a lot of ways, I'm happy. Like it, it happened when it needed to um, for me. But I think that's something that, again, we don't recognize. It's like it's a lot of life skills and life experience that people pick up for better or worse as they're experimenting, bouncing around in their younger years. And if you miss all of that, it's kind of hard to backtrack when you're 30, you know, when you're 29, 30, 34, 40. It is hard. Yeah, it is hard. Um, I have a question like with you leaving your faith as a black man means something culturally different different than what it was like for me to leave my faith as, as a, as a white person. What do, what do you think some of those differences are? Uh, I think the difference is what faith, particularly the Christian faith means to African Americans. Um, people of color in general, I think most people of color religion is in spirituality is deeply embedded in their way of life. Mm-hmm. And particularly for the African-American experience, the church is the first organization that we built on our own. And it's ours. And so many things are funneled through. It was the one place we had that was ours. That's why even for, you know, recent times when church membership was going down in other places, it held steady um, in black congregations until recently. And the reason being is because that's the one place you can go be black. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like you can go and experience your own people there. You can, you can advance and connect and do things in black church spaces that you can't do as easily or at all in white spaces. Mm-hmm. I can advance sometimes. I can move up. I can have an amount of dignity and respect. Me talking or acting or behaving in ways that express my unique type of blackness won't limit me from getting a preaching opportunity wow. or from being able to sing or from being respected. And of course, these all have some very big, you know, caveats and, 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 and asterisks by them. But if I go in there and say, you know, if, if I talk like I'm talking to, to my black friends back home, if I talk like it to people at work and most people there are white, 
or even other people of color who don't like white people, well, don't like black people, because that happens plenty of times too. You know, if if I have a bunch of white guys and maybe an Indian guy and a Hispanic guy, and I'm talking like I do the folks who were back home, that can limit me. Mm-hmm. But if I talk that way at church, mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily bother, it, does, it doesn't hinder me. Mm-hmm. And that was the place that was for us. It was where we gathered, is where we organized, is where we, you know, it's it's on a very practical level. It was a place where we could take care of ourselves and organize ourselves and 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 plan and strategize and be at peace and enjoy and sometimes be safe, you know, things like that. And so it means something different, mm. generally speaking, for African Americans than it does, I would say, for white people in that way, because it's you have options. <laughs> you have other places to go or you can be who you are. Yeah. And and church isn't I, this is probably way super general, but church was not an escape. Church was an escape for us. It was our refuge. And I don't mm-hmm. necessarily think that's the case necessarily for a lot of people who, who a lot of white people who go to church. It's not, it's where we go. So many things still are funneled through the church that it's almost impossible to avoid because it's what we have. I mean, besides like things like, you know, black Greek letter organizations and things like that. We don't have these institutions where we can, where we're fully in control of what we do say and how we organize ourselves. Right. And so, right. so that's why it's so much. And, and is the idea that, well, God brought us through, right? God took care of us. And it's a generally romanticized view of how churches have been through civil rights. And mm-hmm. I think that's romanticized, for definitely for white folks, <laughs> right. but for us as well, um, it's an idea of the church. And I mean, it, it's difficult because on the on the ground level, we all. I mean, I've had great experiences there too. That's why I stayed for so long. So it's not like it's a total dumpster fire, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I think that if you if you reach a certain point of awareness of yourself and of life, of religion, of faith. It can make church, church generally, and definitely, you know, the black church experience difficult. For a lot of people, blackness and church and, and spirituality, they're assumed to be one and the same because of the prevalence mm-hmm. and importance of the church in black life in the, in, you know, um, in the mind of Americans, of all Americans. And so it's assumed that those things go together. And so when you out of that, it can be difficult for people to place you. Same thing with ladies mm, are being gay. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the conception of that is like, oh, wait a minute, black and gay? Even though right. these people exist, in a lot of people's minds, it's hard to conceptualize those things together right. because um, for, for a lot of situations. Um, and so if I'm in the space where it's a, if it's all gay, then the black part of me is kind of like, oh, well, oh, we missed that part. But then the black space is sometimes going to be like, oh, well, we miss gay? What's that? And so it's this mm-hmm. weird, but there are, there's a, a strong, strong trend of African American thinkers who have rejected religion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it it's not just simply, oh, well, you started getting all those books or whatever. Like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale yep. Hurston, um, I'm there's oh I'm drawing all types of blanks right now about names. A. Philip Randolph, I believe, like mm-hmm. it's all types of people and folks who even worked with and attended and engaged with churches, not because they believed, but because hey, there's huge organizing potential here, or hey, I pay tithes. I don't believe in God at all, but I pay tithes because this church gives to the poor. They make sure that people get their light, keep their lights on, that their bills are paid. And so they interact with it from a from a strategic standpoint, hmm. and so there's a very strong trend of that. And for me, that's interesting because it's the idea the idea that black people all think and do the same thing. To me, I think it's just not it's not helpful to anybody, right? Because um, it's almost like our humanity gets taken away because everybody sees us the same, and then it's like no, there's all there's all types of ways to be black. Black just comes in lots of flavors um, and shades, literally and figuratively. I like that. Yeah. 
And you actually, you've done a few episodes of a podcast about this, right? Like it's kind of, it's still kind of out there. Yes. Um, well, I mean, we didn't really, we, we hit all that sometimes, but it's called the Dell and Jess show. I did it in, I did it with my friend, Jessica. Uh-huh. And we talk about a lot of, cause we've been through similar experiences and we've been to a lot of the same churches and things like that. Uh-huh. And so we talk about just our experience of how we learned and how we grew out of these situations. And we talk, cause usually the progressive faith conversation tends to leave out people of color right oh absolutely totally and, yeah and i remember it was a while back it was some guy you know who says uh you know i don't like religion but i like jesus type of thing whatever uh-huh. something yeah type of thing. <laughs> and he got all types of book sales and everything whatever yeah. and this is when twitter like i was a really big part of like of of religious critique twitter i guess what you would call it sure and so that was early on in that stage and so we were all like there are plenty of black people who have said the same thing uh-huh. and right. I'll just jump right past them. Yeah. 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 It's like, there Definitely. are so many people who have said this, who are of all sorts of color and they don't get book deals. They don't get speaking deals. They, right. don't, get speaking right. they don't get, they don't get the opportunity. They don't get elevated as these spiritual icons. And it's not that they're not out there. You know what I mean? It's just that, you know, it, it, it caters to a particular type of audience, even in the anti-racism work and things like that. Oh, absolutely. That, it, no, 100%. You know, it, yeah, yeah, definitely. It tends to be, it's, I mean, people are trying to change it, and I think it's getting a little better, but it still has a long way to go, I would say. So we need to take a break. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what Verdell is up to now um, in his life after when we get back. Um, I also want to, I want to ask you another question about that, uh, that, that liberal theology thing because I think Ooh. that's interesting. Ooh. When we get the, back, I'm on the edge of my seat. We'll be right back after this. Do you have a story you want to tell us? Or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org all one word, and click the Contact Us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash thelifeafterorg. Or email us at info at thelifeafter.org. We would love to hear, hear from... <sighs> Let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. You're listening to The Life After. We're back with our guest Verdell and... Brady Harden. What's so funny, Brady? I was going to make fun of you, <laughs> but I decided not to. Uh, Verdell, you so you uh, spent some time in the um, in the more progressive liberal side of Christianity, right? Like a, a fairly significant amount of time. Yes. Um, so one of the criticisms that we get occasionally on this show, and something that I actually wrestle with myself, is that a lot of our criticism on this show is of fundamentalist Christianity, or like more, mm-hmm. more, uh, you know, the the more conservative end of Christianity. And it's really easy to pick on that side of Christianity. And most of Brady's experience is there, so a lot of it, a lot of it comes from there. Um, what, but you, you spent some time in the left and you still, like me, still, still sort of, uh, moved past Christianity. What you was left your, the left. You left the left. Uh, what was your, what was your experience there? And what was, <laughs> what's sort of your criticism of that side? Um, if anything, I probably got more left for real, which is what really made me left. Ma- really made me leave. Uh-huh. I actually understood what it more meant to be on the left. Right. Um, and as right, right. I, as I got more. To, to use a scary word, radicalized. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, it made me be like, oh, uh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I think what, one, I think progressive, particularly when it comes to religion, is a clunky term because it tries to, it tries to be a catch-all, mm-hmm. but it really doesn't. Mm-hmm. Because you can be progressive on one thing and not another. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, And so there are plenty of people, like, I like even from my circles, there are plenty of people who are progressive when it comes to, let's say, women preachers. Uh huh. But anything involving queer people is a no. Right, right, right. Or, or it involves more discussion, mm-hmm. right? In big square quotes. Um, or you can say, okay, 
gay people are okay. Like I know plenty of even gay churches with gay pastors who, when you hear them preach, if you didn't see their first gentleman on the pulpit with them, they would sound like anybody from TBN. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so yeah, yeah. what's what's the point of wow. you being gay and being open about it if what you're preaching is still just as dangerous mm-hmm. as anybody else, you know? And 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 it's a process, right? I mean, I didn't, you know, when I came out and understood my gayness, it, I didn't, you know, it, it took a lot for me to, let's say, start understanding trans issues more or gender non-conforming people or or understanding, you know, things like class and like, you know, things. It took. It, it didn't happen overnight, of course. My my contention is not that people don't need to learn. Is that people? In my experience. People do know better. They just choose not to do better. Okay. Because yeah. it's not expedient. Right, right, right. Um, particularly now in a lot of progressive circles or circles that are, pro- are adjacent to like these progressive spaces, it's very cool to use progressive sounding language and do absolutely nothing. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And I've had a number of notable preachers who, because I've worked on issues that were involving black church and sexuality, working on a lot of stuff involving those type of efforts, advocacy efforts, things like that. I have plenty of preachers who I've talked to say, yeah, you know, Doc, and we're working on this, and we got to try to do things right, and I want to learn and do more and do better. People who have been to the same type of schools that I've been to and Mm -hmm. know the same people that I do have access to the same type of books and resources. So we're not talking about somebody who's going coming from – you know, a Kenneth Hagen church don't know what to do. We're talking right, about somebody, right, right. Sure. somebody who went who went to Duke Seminary or, yeah. or Duke Divinity School. Yeah. Somebody who who is who's is connected to people, connected to folks who know how to read and study and do the academic thinking piece, who just flat out choose not to. They yeah. just don't do it. And so for me, that that began to say, okay. It's really a huge emphasis on being represented, which does have a purpose. But just because me having an oppressed identity does not equal me being good Mm -hmm. or good for the movement. There are plenty of gay people who are terrible. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, yeah. There are plenty of black people who I do not like. Yeah. Those black people should not be oppressed because of their race. But no, I don't want to be their friend. Right, right. And I think that, and and the, the the problem is, it has been such a lack of people in prominent places, right? But at least for me, this shows just kind of you know where where I am. Putting black people in those spaces, or putting anyone in those spaces who's been, who's been historically oppressed, sure, it could be a good thing. But maybe that place shouldn't exist in the first place. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yes, having a seat at the table is great. Maybe there should be no table. Maybe we should all have to stand. And I think that's <laughs> the thing um, yeah. that makes it different. And I think that, again, going back to your question, I think also liberal and cross Christianity still, at least for me, does not answer the questions of theosity. It doesn't answer them. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, it, no, I totally it comes, agree. It comes up with very well-explained I mean, it's very well thought out, but you still end up at, well, God is good and still worth it based on, yeah. it's still a leap of faith. I think as, um, yeah, who yeah. Is it? Albert, Albert Camus would say it's, it's a leap of faith. Right. Right. Um, right. Go that direction. And it doesn't, that, that's the issue. And, and also lastly, it doesn't really, no one really knows what they're for. Like, I mean, I can say the things that matter, like the list, but unlike the right, you know what the right is for. Every time something pops up, you know what these folks are going to say. Yeah, yeah. For the most, but when some, but you don't really know what the Christian left will say yeah. when something yeah, pops. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, you know, yeah. Because the Christian, I mean, the right is the right, but on the left, you have everybody ranging from just to use political figures as a spectrum. You have everybody from a Hillary Clinton to a Bernie Sanders uh-huh. to a Angela Davis uh-huh. to you know all like yep. it's so many people on that sphere and so you don't know there are plenty of people on the left who will be like no abortion is bad it should be illegal 
Yeah. Do they still get, do they do, do they still get called progressives? Right, right. They voted for me to get married. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, a big problem that I have with progressive Christianity and most of its forms in in America is twofold. One is what you were just saying is that like I think that most most modern leftist Christians are sort of in this like pendulum swing rebellion against the rightist environment that they grew up in, or it's like a it's like an a f- it's like a backlash to evangelicalism so yeah. it's there's still like right roots to it and they still are trying to maintain sort of a connection with the right um because that's their roots as christians right so you that's how you end up with like uh with like sort of these left christians that like are totally cool with gay but not cool with abortion or vice versa or whatever weird mix of things that you end up mm-hmm. with you know yeah it's very and well, one, I think this is why I appreciate what Reza Aslan does and a lot of the, the work that he's done. And he highlights how religion is a lot about identity for people. And yeah. so yep. when you look at it, it's when you hear the, the leaps of logic that people do and like the mental gymnastics that you have to do mm-hmm. to maintain a level of faith. Like you have to. Yeah. You have to either yep. not be aware of realities or you have to eventually settle for very convoluted disappointing answers responses yeah, yeah exactly to, yeah. to maintain like you, there, there's no way around you have to settle for answers that just would never fly with anything or anybody else if you're a healthy yeah. rational person um and then and, and, and that's how i view it uh, but if you in order to to it's they can do that because that's not the point. The point is, this is who I see myself. And if I don't have this, I don't know who I am. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's really the thing. So the, the, right. that's yeah. why Absolutely. the logic part isn't the important part. Yeah. The thing is, I have to maintain my sense of who I am. Yeah. If I don't have this, I don't know who I am. But I also think that um, a, what the the left section of Christianity in recent general needs to do is in order to advance, it needs to do two things. One, it needs to not be a response to the right. Yeah. I agreed. Yeah. It needs totally. to be its own thing. Yeah. There are lots of people who would sympathize with them. Even if there are people of faith, it's like, listen, look, there are atheists who will come out and vote for, for and support you because they want abortion to be legal or they want these other things, whatever. Like they're, is people who would support you if we knew what you were about and we don't really know mm-hmm. but at the same time while we don't need to be a response to the right we don't understand why the right always wins the right always the right wins as one on the so that was that it did because they're together mm-hmm. they're organized mm-hmm. they have they're very efficient in how they do things thanks jerry follow and, and and they're they're very together and how they, and i mean again when you kind of all are on the same page mm-hmm. It's easier to do that, but we need to adopt some of those same things. And the problem is that on the left, the left, the Christian left, like the left in general, particularly like, let's say Democrats, it's more like a coalition of groups, right? Yeah. And so you have, and you have people who are on the left, not even really because they want to be there, but because it's, they're picking it because this is the place where I can advocate for my own well-being and safety. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so you have black people right. that's, and trans that's people, very accurate. Yeah, wow. white people, and you have all these people together, all these groups together, who have their own issues with each other, uh-huh. who are trying to arrive at some consensus, uh-huh. where on the right it's just, yep, no gays, no abortion, yep. no food stamps, ready to go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's roll. Yeah, for sure. That's a great point. Wow. That's really good. Um my other my other sort of beef with with uh with leftist christianity it goes back to sort of what you said about uh you can have a gay pastor that preaches the same thing as they're saying on TBN right like so i have problems with at this point i have issues with very non uh controversial teachings of christianity right like i talk so much about shame on this show like the entire idea that you are an inherently flawed person that needs a savior is not a controversial idea that is a a, a, a partisan idea within christianity that's not a left or right thing that's something that everybody believes and everybody preaches and i just fundamentally disagree with that you know i mean like i've i've moved past that sort of like 
that idea that I, I'm an inherently shameful, broken being and that I need a savior, you know what I mean? Yeah, the, the idea that the, the God who created, like that somehow our parents, these two people who populated the whole world, made a mistake by eating an apple that, why'd you put it there anyway? Right. Oh, God. Um, you know what I mean? But see, here's the thing with this, for that about me. I still like, I love the Bible still. I still like those stories mm -hmm. because I see them as a myth. And the people of the time also viewed them as a myth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it wasn't until recently when people started treating them as truth, mm -hmm. as, as, as not just truth, but facts. Right. And so the whole point, the point was never that there was a literal Adam and a literal Eve and a literal tree. The point was the lessons that were being told from it. Right. And people created these stories and created their religions to explain why their conditions were. And so if you are, if you are a people who live in the desert on arid hills where it's hard to farm and it doesn't rain that often, you might make up a story where you have to figure out, well, this explains why things suck. Uh huh. <laughs> so why it doesn't rain too often? Right, right, and right. It's, it's 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 so human because it's not that they were dumb. Yeah. They just didn't know about rain and how it worked and everything. Like you know, like they didn't know these things. So this is their way of expanding the world. Yep. And it can teach us something about how people work and what matters. And it's very human. So I love that part of it. Um. And so I think that to acknowledge it as myth, not like you like people today think myth means lie, mm -hmm. right? But a myth is a story about how we make sense of the world. Yep, and yep, so, absolutely. you know, and, and, and yep. that's, the, the point isn't that the details are true. The, well, the point isn't that, that, that they're facts, rather, is that the story tells something true about our experience. Right, right. That's absolutely. Huge. Yeah. And that that redeems it for me. As I'm like, no, yeah. I don't, most of this, if not all. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I like that. It, it's <laughs> like, I don't, the point isn't that Jesus literally hopped out of a grave. The point is that, oh, things can start again, uh -huh. or if something is really important, there's another way to get around, or that you know there's something beyond right. what you're fighting. So what you fighting for what's important often exists beyond any one person's life. Mm -hmm. You know, as many other things you can get from it than the fact that Jesus literally popped out of the grave. Which honestly, that was one of my I think my first or second big seminary lesson. My, I had Dr. Hobson, who everybody was like terrified of because he was the one that would mess with everybody's theology. Sure. He was the first person I said that I heard say, oh, I don't pray. What for? And uh -huh. I was like, what? Oh. But, um, right. but he talked about how even at Easter, as I think about it, we celebrate a dead person coming back to life mm -hmm. and think that it's literal. What if your grandmother knocked on your door? Would you be happy? Right. But would you be terrified? <laughs> right. right. Even if even if she didn't look like a zombie, if she looked like if I know if my nana popped up at my door, I would like I wouldn't be like, oh, you've returned. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm so oh, happy. Oh, that's really that interesting. Yeah, yeah. And this person came back, and and it's just it's for me understanding it as a myth allows me to still take the good things uh -huh. that are there, and still very controversial. But it takes the good stuff. It allows you to see the point instead of having to have the facts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's really important. What what do you what would you say is one of the biggest like good things that you've taken away from Christianity that you still live with today in practice? Huh. Jesus, I would say that. I think Jesus is great. Um, hmm. I think Jesus, as he's presented and as in his context can speak so much to our time today, particularly for what I believe what his concerns were. I don't, I believe Jesus was a marginalized Jew amongst other marginalized Jews who was experiencing supreme levels of oppression from an occupying force in terms of their life expectancy, their resources, their treatment, their culture, and decided to do something against it. And he was not alone in that response. Like, there were many, like, people always said about Matthias, but it was like, there are many other messiahs besides Jesus. Um, Jesus actually was one of the worst ones. Um, <laughs> honest, like, he wasn't one of the more well-known ones. It took a while for him to catch on. There were other people who were, right. like, by, by our metrics of success, or people who were more successful, more popular, more right, well-known right, right. than he was. But there was something unique about him, like the way that he healed people and did not charge them. 
um, which is something that we skip over every time. But it's like, no, it was customary. Like being an exorcist was a profession. Mm. He was willing to his rights to ask for money. And he mm-hmm. said, no, only do work around the really poor people and don't ask them for any money. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. When like that, when you understand that the issue, the woman with the issue of blood makes it, it has a different tone to right. it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Understand that, or Jesus telling the young ruler who did everything, like, "Oh, well, I did everything, Master." He said, "Oh, you did, you did great, but you have one thing that you're missing: sell all your belongings and become like us." Right. And he didn't, which reflects the idea that Jesus' people were all. Poor and that the rich people were new, really not well regarded. Right, right. Yeah. By these early believers, like rich people, really, they said many of the same things that you'll see people say to talk about today. Yep, absolutely. And so yeah. It's it's like the whole reason Jesus died is because he launched an attack on uh-huh. the temple, which was like the financial and cultural and spiritual center of Jerusalem, and so he uh, he stages this attack, this protest. Which I don't really know how you non-violently make a whip and flip tables. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, so I always say that Jesus' relationship with non-violence is Jesus never was like, "Let's go kill them all." Right, right. But right. he thought that God would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he thought that God would come and kick the Romans out. Yeah. And how do you think God would, as a Jew in that time, do you think God was going to scoop them up in His arms of love and mercy and carry them all back to Rome? Right. Right. No. Uh, that's how he thought it would no, work. Yeah, yeah. So, and so, but that's why he died. He he launches this huge attack on the temple, and he runs to the woods, and the police find him, and he gets ca- he gets arrested and crucified by the Romans. Right. Hmm. How like that? That says something. And it was other people who were kidnapped for the same similar crime. You know, he, like he was considered a threat against Rome. Like he mm-hmm. was some tree hugger. You know, who's saying, you know, come to the altar, all who will open your heart up to me. Right, yeah. Rome's not going to care about someone like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I think that for me, his willingness to say, no, my people are being mistreated. This is wrong. Yeah. We need to do something about this. And he took, and his idea of God changed to the point where it allowed him to make room for this. And he was like, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. The thing, things that his other fellow Jews might have considered wrong, it was like, no, it doesn't really matter. What matters more is that we're together. Mm-hmm. You can touch the infirm because it's more important that we're together than than us making... We're making separations between us where there's a bigger reality than the fact that you are on your cycle and you have semen on your clothes and you have leprosy. Mm-hmm. It's something bigger than all of that. So let's forget it. To me, those things really, 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 really make a difference. And if more mm-hmm. people, I would totally be for Christianity, not necessarily for God, because I think, like I said, for me, the, theism and God to me aren't the same. Mm-hmm. But I would totally be here, even though I wouldn't necessarily, you know, pray to this God. But if there was a massive movement of Christians who were more like that, yeah, 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 be here. For we need more of that. Totally. That's huge. Because I don't I I never had the permission, never gave myself permission or had the permission to view Jesus as just as as, as a myth. You know, and to be able to like kind of reap the the, the good out of that stuff without taking it one hundred percent literal. Um but I think there's there's a lot of freedom in that of you know, even now I was thinking about this the other day, like uh do I have beef against Jesus? You know, and, and I got to think, well, yeah, he did claim to be the, the son of God and, you know, said he was the only way, blah, 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 blah. But still, if I view the things that he's saying, you know, as, as, as more as a myth and not as literal, um, there are still things that I can glean from that and, mm-hmm. and not have to shut, you know, this important character out of my life completely. Yeah. Um, I could just put him in a completely different category and treat him um, in a way that, honestly, I think he was meant to be treated from the first place. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it can be really liberating to 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 sort of uh, to sort of rebuild your view of Jesus. So uh, so where are you now? So what do you, what do you what's sort of your your driving philosophy? Or you sort of mentioned uh, you mentioned Bruce Lee. You mentioned Camus. You, I mean, I can tell you you know you're you know what you're what you you've you've put some thought into this what do you what do you kind of 
what do you kind of base yourself off of now? What do you go? What do you go from? I say this. This is the best way I can put it. I believe in myself. Yeah. Um, the only spirit that I'm really concerned about knowing and acknowledging is my own. Hmm. Um, and the people in the spirit and, and of those around me mm-hmm. and who I'm interested it with. That's really it. Yeah. Um, I like. I can't say because it's long, but it's a quote that Bruce Lee had. He's like, you know, I have this feeling it's bigger than faith and it's animating me somehow. So I don't I don't know where it is. Maybe you can find it and put it in your show notes or something. Sure, but, sure. Um, it's it's to me, that's what I felt. It's like I have this like Bruce Lee had great faith, mm-hmm. but he also didn't believe in God. Right. 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 <laughs> I like that. And so I like that. And so um, and, you know, him in his funny way, he said, you know, um, someone asked him, like, you know, his, I think his brother, I think, asked him, do you believe in God? And he was like, what? And he was just like, I don't know, basically, you know, he was like, no, do you believe in God? And he's like, no, I believe in sleep, you know, something like that. And he's like, no, do you, like, you, do you believe in God? He was like, no, I, I, I do not. Yeah. You know, and so this idea of believing, like, Bruce Lee had tremendous faith, but he did not have faith in something that was outside of himself. Right, right. And so I relate to that very much, like, you know, his, his chi, his internal energy, you know, and then, you know, right. being, a, you know being a martial artist, understanding, you know, you know, it's not just, you know, throwing beams across the room. It's your, 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 your spirit, your will, your, your, your effort, the, uh-huh. the amount of effort and intensity you put into something, you know, that's really a lot of what, what she is, your, your, your life force, your right. vigor and, and how like what Bruce Lee had was faith and that and will mixed all together and more. And so for me, that's what I really relate to. I would say that's really where I am and learning how to have deeper faith in myself, my capabilities and my desires and, 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 uh-huh. and, and trying to use that to shape my experience and the experience of those around me for the better. So I kind of like that you mentioned uh, Camus in your questionnaire because on the, on the sort of the flip side of that is like, you sort of have simplified your spirituality to fit this, like, you, it, it's like you and the people around you, and those are the people that you want to get to know. Uh, and for Camus, like, the, it's sort of the philosophy of the absurd, and you sort of mentioned, like, so many Christians and so many spiritual people are trying, like, have this obsession with making sense of everything as a big scheme or a big plan, like, there's, like, there's mm-hmm. this God who orchestrates, and Camus' whole philosophy was like, no, nothing makes sense uh and and why why are we putting so much effort into trying to put the puzzle pieces together yeah i, I you know i my first exposure to that was not even from Camus, it was from alan watts oh yeah okay yeah definitely and so um yeah. if you read um, what was it i read the wisdom of insecurity uh-huh. a few, you know and i read that and it was just like wow he blew my like he just blew my world wide open uh-huh. and then I stumbled upon Albert Camus and I read like my favorite is just the, I mean, I get excited just still every time I read, you know, um, the myth of Sisyphus and just what he was saying and what that meant. And ooh, that was just so like, to me, that really matters. And to me just to say, look, this really is all pointless. And you people either life is absurd. People respond to it either by killing themselves or making a leap of faith. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's another, but but there's another way, and the way is basically to make up your meaning for yourself as you go along. Mm-hmm. And how I think this the most powerful line is that you know, you know that Sisyphus was stronger than his rock. Um. In that in that piece, and to me that that's just very empowering to me. It's all it's almost like scripture to me now. It's like you know just the idea yeah. of. Each time he pushes, pushes the rock up there, I mean, I don't know if people know who Sisyphus is, if they even know who that person is. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, I, I know. He, yeah, he was effectively sentenced to rolling a stone up a hill and chasing it back down and rolling it back up for yeah. the eternity. But. but you know what the cool thing is? No one really knows what Sisyphus did to make the gods so angry. But one of the possibilities is that he actually consistently outsmarted the gods. Oh, and, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so he outsmarted Zeus and everybody else. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Like he outsmarted Hades, and he he found a, he found a way to come back to life for a day, and then managed to not go back. Like he he made a fool of the divine. <laughs> right, right. And so the punishment was, was to do make his life arbitrary, meaningless, completely you know meaningless. I mean? Yeah. And, but that somehow he must have found a way to even overcome that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so to me, that was just like it's that's the powerful part that we have the ability to make meaning, and even like the stuff. 
and our lives can be very absurd. Like you do everything yeah. right and it all blows up yep. and yeah. you, you know, you, 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 you don't, no one is running like, yay, bills are due and, and relationships are strained. And a lot of life is totally like, it's a cruel trick to have yeah. this level of consciousness and to be teetering over the edge mm-hmm. every second. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Like, it's not fun. But we can make meaning out of it. And I think yeah. that's, for me, is like, well, what does this mean for me? What can I get from this for me? Mm-hmm. And the idea that a God that's supposed to care about me in any way would say, oh, let's make up this really hellish situation that'll probably scar you for life mentally or physically. Right. Like, that's- it's, so much, it's so much nicer to just be like, it's, it's chaos. It's crazy. It's random. I'm so much more comfortable with that than I am yeah. with the idea that somebody's orchestrating it. Because if it's a plan, then you can like not go according to the plan. And there's right. this big, particularly in like some of the Christians that that uh, that you and that you and I I were in. There's a really big deal of finding God's purpose for your uh-huh. life, and so you have to find like you yeah. know where it's a purpose. And it's and, this it's this endless that. quest. It's this dangling carrot, you know, in it, so many ways. It's a quest to find out why did God make me? Like I'm one of the toys from Santa's workshop. Right, like, right, right. right. Like, why was I made? Yeah. What is my function? Yeah. And you have to, you spend so much time figuring out what somebody who you'll never meet meant yeah. that you don't live your own life. It's very true. Uh, Verdell, thank you so much. This is yes, a really good you. interview. This is really great. Um, thank you for your time. Um, if you get a chance, check out his podcast. That's that's uh, yeah, I guess you, you you haven't worked on it in a while, but it's still out there, right? It's still up there. I mean, we're coming back probably in a couple of months. All right, cool. Episode, well, I'm looking forward but, to uh, it. It's still a bunch of episodes up there in the Della Jess show, and you can definitely find them and listen to them. In awesome, the beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, Remember, if you don't go to church, uh, Sunday Sunday's is just, just a second, second Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> 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 Amen. <laughs> Thank you.